Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time to watch this recording of the lecture that I was supposed to deliver in Berlin. I'm sorry about uh, the itinerary mess up. Uh, but let me get straight to it. Uh, I'd like to frame this talk in terms of a Greek myth, uh, the myth of Tantalus, who was uh, cursed by the gods to forever be reaching for food uh, that he could never actually grasp. Every time he would reach for a piece of fruit in the branches above his head, it would recede from his grasp. And often in the study of social behavior or social heuristics as a subset of that, uh, we often feel this frustration that we are tantalized. The theory recommends particular heuristics that we should find, and yet when we seek empirical verification, they recede, as it were, from our grasp. Uh, in this talk, I'd like to try to shed some light on why I think that happens and propose some uh, advances, some ways to proceed to help us actually grasp some fruit. Uh, let me get into that by changing the topic from Greek mythology to lions. Uh, lions are social carnivores. They live in groups. It's not entirely clear exactly why they live in groups. There are many options. For example, people often say they live in groups because carnivores hunt better in packs, but that alone doesn't mean that they should live in groups. It merely means that they should hunt in groups. And yet lions actually hang out, as seen here, in groups almost all the time. Uh, and one of the probable reasons why is because they defend territories and their young from other lions. In particular, lions, like most mammals, are infanticidal. When males enter new groups, they kill offspring that were sired by other males. This brings females back into cycling faster and um, helps them spread their genes. Uh, so females have a, a collective interest in keeping new males out of the groups. This favors territoriality, as the story goes, and group living. However, there's uh, a dilemma to be solved. Uh, the lions need some sort of social heuristic by which they can stop lazy females from cheating on their defensive territories. And of course, for a female lion to repel a male lion does require some assistance because they're highly sexually dimorphic. Uh, this has been studied uh, in some depth in biology over the last several decades, and studies are still ongoing. Uh, one of my favorite uh, moments in the history of this empirical study is this newspaper article uh, from uh, an Ohio newspaper in 1995 uh, entitled, Lions Don't Play Tit for Tat. Uh, and this was a big scientific result. I was just starting graduate school when um, the science paper that this newspaper article is based on came out, and it, start, it generated something of a tizzy uh, in the evolutionary biology community as we were so puzzled that we did not find tit for tat in lions uh, what could they be doing if we can't find tit for tat here? Uh, shouldn't they be using reciprocity? Uh, and some people actually inferred, including some of the authors of the study, that this evidence suggested that reciprocity is not part of what maintains cooperation in lions. Um, I think that this is uh, a sad episode, actually, in the history of the study. It's one of these examples of being tantalized because we have the wrong target, I'm going to argue. Uh, we didn't find tit for tat, and we never should have been looking for it. Uh, instead, uh, uh, the models suggest something quite different. Uh, and in this talk, I want to develop what they actually suggest. Uh, there's a story here of the misreading of theory, a story here of uh, empirical frustration. Uh, but in the end, it's a happy story, because out of this uh, episode in 1995, a lot of broader understanding has arisen. Uh, and now I think most people who study uh, reciprocity in wild populations aren't looking, nor do they expect, uh, tit for tat to be what animals use. Uh, what has replaced it is going to take uh, the next 40 to 50 minutes to develop, uh, but I want to come back to Tantalus for a moment and, and talk about some of the reasons the fruit keeps receding in the study of social heuristics. Uh, divide these for convenience into three categories, the historical obstacles, empirical obstacles, and conceptual obstacles. I'm mainly going to focus on conceptual obstacles in this talk, uh, but the other two categories are going to get woven in as we go through, and really you can't separate these three things. They're all um, part of the same complex of issues. Uh, on the historical side, uh, I'll start by showing this image of Fortuna, the Roman goddess of chance or fortune, uh, which was a fickle and somewhat wicked personification to the Romans the antithesis of Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, uh, who was deterministic uh, and uh, sought to bring uh, understanding to humans. Fortuna, on the other hand, was fickle and dangerous. Uh, the, the wheel of fortune that she holds in her hand there brings you up. It will then inevitably bring you down, as 
the man who is sitting on top is about to experience. Uh, this is part of the historical obstacle to studying heuristics is that we have a tradition in the West of not looking for them, of expecting optimization or deterministic solutions that are reliable in all contexts, that we can, we can somehow uh, extract knowledge from its context and have it be useful. And it's taken us a long time to develop intellectual traditions that have gotten out of that problem. Uh, uh, Gickerinzer and colleagues have used this uh, taxonomy of visions of rationality, which I think is still quite descriptively accurate of the debates across um, the social and biological sciences, that one of the historical uh, obstacles we face in studying social heuristics is that lots of people aren't looking for them. They're looking for demons, as described here. That is, these sort of uh, uh, beings of infinitely computational power, and that we want to imitate them somehow and seek the kinds of solutions that they would find. Instead, we find ourselves as boundedly rational agents and we have to seek other things. Uh, but many of the tools that we have developed in the social sciences and biology, uh, economics in particular, are focused on demonic solutions. Uh, and they don't help us solve these problems, but it's often all we have to work with. Um, Part of that uh, historical baggage is the empirical methods that are available to us, but let, let me cut them apart from uh, pure history for a moment. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to weave in some of the empirical challenges, by which I mean how we make models with data to study social heuristics. Um, part of this empirical challenge, as I'll try to explain as we go, is that it's often quite difficult to differentiate uh, social heuristics, even when we know uh, the truth of what they are. Uh, and I'm going to try to bring that in, but uh, this means the statistical tools that all of us were taught as undergrads and often in graduate school are absolutely not up to the task of studying social heuristics. Uh, and part of that is also experimental design, uh, which is a point I would like to close with today. Um, but as I said, for most of the talk, I'm going to talk about conceptual issues. Uh, the conceptual issues are that I think um, you can get a better grasp on the historical and empirical obstacles uh, in studying social heuristics by understanding the broader conceptual nature of the environments that they live in. And these environments are social environments that are highly dynamic uh, and, and, in a sense, cybernetic. Uh, I hesitate to use that word because it lacks content for most native speakers. Uh, but all I mean is that uh, in, for example, this scene of a school of fish with some sharks, most of these fish don't know where the sharks are. And yet the population of fish certainly does know where the sharks are and avoids them very well. Uh, and that's because each little fish with this tiny bit of information uh, can signal to its immediate neighbors. Uh, and the immediate neighbors can start a cascade of information and behavior that helps the entire population of fish avoid dangers and forage while doing so, even though each individual fish lacks the resources or cognitive abilities to do this on their own. And so the social heuristics of the fish, and of course of the sharks here too, uh, depend upon this environment. They depend upon being in a school of fish in order to function. And absent the population, the social heuristics make no sense at all. Uh, and that is the general conceptual truth of all social heuristics, is that they only make sense in the context of a complex population. That is, social heuristics live in complex populations, and that means that the study of them should be different than the study of simple heuristics that work in static environments. A uh, little bit of uh, unpacking what I mean by that. Uh, what I'd like to convince you of is that the population does a lot of the computation that makes social heuristics work. So at the individual level, social heuristics uh, ignore a lot of information, uh, and they do better often by, uh, through that ignorance, and they use simple rules to integrate the information they have. Uh, and a lot of people, um, especially at uh, Max Planck, have studied the details of the design of such heuristics. At the population level, social heuristics depend upon social dynamics that integrate information across different agents using perhaps different social heuristics and this integration lets the population do things, compute things, that individuals cannot. Uh, like, for example, can leverage division of labor and comparative advantage uh, and discover uh, fantastic things that individuals lack the resources to be able to do. Uh, the population really does compute stuff. And understanding the design of social heuristics, I want to convince you, depends upon understanding the design of the population as well. And not only is design, of course, but it's dynamic design how it responds to changes in the frequencies of behavior, and so on. And of course, this is not really a new point. It's part and parcel of the study of social heuristics for everyone who really does it. 
Uh, but uh, I want to argue that a lot of our methods and our concepts about how we approach and analyze those heuristics have not yet fully embodied this realization. Um, I have to say uh, that Herbert Simon, of course, thought of this uh, before uh, the rest of us. Uh, here's, here's one of uh, Simon's famous quotes, that human beings viewed as behaving systems are quite simple. The apparent complexity of our behavior over time is largely a reflection of the complexity of the environment in which we find ourselves. Here he's talking about this fact that the strategies people themselves use are often quite simple and often quite myopic. Uh, However, the integration of them in a complex social environment means they can do powerful things for people uh, to serve human interests. But it's not that the complexity of design is embodied in individual people. It's embodied in the social environment that's of the complexity. And I'm merely unpacking this point and trying to develop it further. Um, so uh, let me try to do that first by being a little bit specific about definitions. Definitions are necessary. Everybody has to have one, but uh, uh, none of them are perfect. So I want to take a working definition of heuristic, uh, which will be familiar to this audience, that a heuristic is a behavioral strategy that ignores some information in order to do better. It does not ignore the information because it has to or it must, uh, but rather by ignoring the information, it can actually outcompete strategies that use more information. And there's been a successful research tradition of doing that. Uh, social heuristics are a special case of this. Uh, they also ignore some information in order to do better. Um, but what they have added to them is that their success depends upon the behavior of other agents. Now there's not a static environment to be adapted to, but you have to play against everybody else in a game of life in which there's imperfect information, asymmetries in information, uh, and uh, uh, so getting the, the social environment right is now critical. Uh, in a broader sense, what I'm talking about is that social heuristics always have feedback, and often quite powerful feedback. Uh, so. Uh, let's take the quintessential case of feedback, which is audio feedback, now basically omnipresent in popular music, which almost always has some dissonance added to it through a feedback mechanism, or at least how that is how it was originally generated uh, back in the lo-fi days. Um, audio feedback is a case where the sound coming out of a speaker can enter a microphone and then be amplified through the loop so that the microphone re-receives it again. And if it receives it at a louder pitch, it will the volume will escalate, and we will get an unpleasant screeching experience. Uh, this is used in heavy metal music, but simply it can be created simply by bringing a guitar, pick up close to a speaker. You can generate as much feedback as you like. These days there are fancy devices like pictured on this slide, which are designed to create custom feedback. It can be wet or dry, uh, moderate, normal, or rampant. Uh, feedback is managed and used to create pleasing uh, auditory, I don't want to say illusions, but uh, auditory artwork. Um, Feedback is a powerful feature of many natural systems. It isn't just used to sell music. Uh, all simple heuristics, of course, may generate feedback, and so understanding them may depend upon understanding those feedbacks. The recognition heuristic, for example, which has been previously studied uh, at the MPI, um, can uh, generate powerful feedback if people base choices, of, for example, where they invest their money or where they live based upon things they recognize, that will feed back and lead others to recognize those things more. Uh, and therefore, the heuristic can create the environment that makes it, makes it successful. Um, but uh, social heuristics, I want to argue, nearly always generate quite strong feedback. Um, and that's because their payoffs, what determines their success, is frequency dependent, meaning it depends upon the mix of heuristics in the population. And there are some heuristics that play well with themselves, and so they do better when they increase in frequency. There are other heuristics that don't play well with others, and they do best when they're at low frequency. Uh, but in real populations, uh, any particular heuristic will, will have payoffs that are quite frequency dependent. The information it needs to function is created by the behavior of others, uh, and therefore there's a strong feedback effect always. Those feedbacks can be positive or negative or uh, other categories of feedback, but they're always there. So let's think to the classic uh, successful simple heuristic, something like take the best, uh, abbreviated TTB on this slide. This is as if the success of take the best depended upon how many people use take the best. Uh, and in a specific sense, that's not true in, in the context in which it's been studied. But of course, uh, there have been people uh, recently who've been studying queue order learning for take the best. And that's a case where the more people who use take the best, the more people will be studying the, the proper queue order. And it may actually be frequency dependent. So 
Uh, perhaps uh, heuristics we haven't previously thought of as social really are because some of the parameters that need to be tuned in them can be tuned socially by populations. Uh, so, uh, I finally got to the actual outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to go over three points here, three, three specific points that I want to pluck out of this um, point that uh, the population does a lot of the computation and that therefore changes the way we should conceptualize uh, social heuristics and, and that they live in dynamic social environments. Uh, the first of these, uh, that um, simple social heuristics generate many different equilibria. That is, there's path dependency. Uh, initial conditions matter, and this makes it difficult to predict exactly which uh, simple heuristics we should find in populations because many different configurations can be self-reinforcing. Uh, second, many, many heuristics can coexist in a population. Uh, there may not be any unique heuristic we should expect, like, for example, tit for tat in lions. If you don't find it, does that mean there's no reciprocity? I think not. Uh, uh, and then third, to re reinforce the second point, not only can many heuristics exist in populations, they probably should. There are strong reasons I think we should expect uh, coexistence, uh, and that is because sometimes coexistence is better for the population. Uh, that is, diversity can enhance the functioning at the population level. Uh, so from these three points at the very end, I want to extract some lessons and leads that can help us uh, achieve a more satisfactory empirical and theoretical study of these social heuristics. Okay, first point. Um, let me ease into uh, the description of many equilibria by talking about a classic uh, dissertation by a Norwegian from 1921, pictured in the lower right as Torleif Schulderup Ebbe. Uh, his dissertation in 1921 on Dallas Domesticus was... Uh, a fairly amazing dissertation, actually, by modern animal behavior standards. He created the modern study of uh, social behavior in the domestic fowl. And in this dissertation, uh, what Torleaf did was uh, did a number of uh, semi-controlled experiments with uh, largely what we would call now free-ranging chickens and studied their pecking order, that is, the minor aggressive actions they take towards one another that over time establish a rigid dominance hierarchy which determines access to food. Uh, at the time, it, it wasn't well understood that this was quite common in the animal world, although the details are, uh, turned out to be very diverse. Uh, so this became a, a fairly famous dissertation in short order. Um, one of the neatest things about this dissertation study is that Torley did experiments where he separated, he would, he would let the chickens interact for a while, studying uh, the dominance hierarchies that formed, and then he would separate them and isolate them in cages for a couple of weeks and then put them back together, and he discovered that was sufficient for the chickens to forget one another and forget their dominance hierarchy, forget the pecking order. And then they would reform a new one, which he would study. And it was not always the same pecking order. Uh, it was correlated with the previous one, but the tiny differences in events and agonistic interactions would stabilize the uh, population of chickens on a new dominance hierarchy, which had incredible uh, material consequences for them because this is, they, they competed for food uh, according to this dominance hierarchy. Uh, so this is one of my favorite uh, empirical examples of multiple equilibria in a system where you would not anticipate in the first place that it should exist. Uh, it is still not, uh, I have to say, completely understood how chickens learn dominance hierarchies. It used to be an active area of research in animal behavior, but it has become unglamorous uh, somehow. Uh, but it is an interesting case where uh, there is some low-hanging fruit that may recede from our grasp, or maybe not. Uh, but certainly the chickens are using simple rules, and yet the population ends up stabilizing on a pattern. Um, let me broaden this back out uh, away from chickens for a moment. Uh, feedback tends to generate sensitivity to initial conditions. It doesn't always. It depends upon the details, uh, but it can quite often. So the water wheels on the right-hand column of this slide uh, are, is a famous example of a kind of feedback that generate sensitivity to initial conditions. These are Lorentz water wheels. Lorentz, uh, often regarded as the father of chaos theory, uh, modern deterministic chaos theory. Uh, you can construct these water wheels yourself with some cups that you poke holes in the bottom and then, and then put on a wheel, a mounted wheel. Uh, all that's required is that there's water pouring out of a single source on the top. Water fills up individual cups. It's leaking out of the bottom of the cup at a slower rate into other cups. It, what this water wheel ends up being is a random number generator. It oscillates and changes direction seemingly at random, and yet it is entirely deterministic depending upon the initial conditions. It is a simple, truly chaotic oscillator, an example of the Lorentz oscillator, actually. 
Uh, these sort of things can occur in natural systems in quite unexpected uh, cases. You can buy these little rinse water wheels for your garden, actually, if you go online. Uh, and they're quite fun to stare at. You can lose a lot of time uh, doing it. Uh, here, I just want you to think of them as, as an anchoring in your mind of this idea of sensitivity to initial conditions. How much water is in each cup or what angle or angular momentum the wheel has when you turn the fountain on will, will generate a distinct sequence of random numbers that are produced by a ran random time series of angular momentums. Uh, cooperation in multiple contexts is the example that I want to unpack over the next several slides that illustrates uh, this sensitivity to initial conditions in a different way. That is, even in quite simple contexts relative to, say, the Lorentz water wheel, it is easy to get multiple equilibria. Even when some of those equilibria, some of those steady states in the population, that is, configurations of social heuristics that come to be stable in a population, even when the, some of those configurations are bad for the population, they can be stable. And this is a powerful point that, of course, is not new. It's as old as game theory, uh, even older. Uh, but it's often overlooked because, I think, partly the history. We're, we're looking for the, some sort of optimal uh, uh, design, and, and one of the themes I want to weave through this talk is that the processes that create uh, social heuristics in populations are themselves, in a sense, satisficing. Uh, there are dynamics to it that aren't like optimization. We need some other kind of metaphor to understand it. Uh, so think of it this way. In the context of cooperation in multiple contexts, what I want to illustrate to you in the next couple slides, repeat interaction itself leads to the generation of a large number of alternative stable states in the population. Repeat interaction does that because it creates conventions, and conventions are self-reinforcing. And it doesn't often matter if the convention is stupid. Uh, you're forced to do it even if you're a savvy agent, uh, because otherwise you get punished by deviating from the convention. And I want to give you an analytical example of this. Uh, the consequence is that uh, this, has, this impedes prediction in empirical context because it's not clear what to predict. It's one of those cases where if, if a game theoretic model predicts everything, then it hasn't taught us anything. So we have to worry about this problem. All right, so let me unpack this. Uh, this is an, a story that I've abstracted away from a paper by Robert Boyd, published in 1992. Um, this paper is hardly ever read because it was in an edited volume. Uh, so partly I'm just trying to advertise it for that reason. It's a unique point. I don't think anyone else has made it uh, mathematically. In, in the context of studying the evolution of cooperation. What I want you to imagine is that uh, there are two contexts in which, which, are, uh, which you could pay some personal cost to help uh, someone in your community. So let's think of the standard iterated prisoner's dilemma context. Individuals are uh, sorted into pairs in the population. Each individual in each pair has the opportunity at a cost to themselves to create a benefit for the other person and vice versa. Um, there are some contexts in which it is mutually beneficial to cooperate. Uh, that is, as long as both individuals are cooperating, the pair as a whole is better off. And this is the classic case of thinking of a prisoner's dilemma. So let's think of a, a context labeled number one, and mutual cooperation is beneficial. This could be something like taking turns taking one another to the airport, a dilemma that academics routinely have. Uh, in this case, uh, it costs you perhaps quite little. It does cost you something to drive your uh, colleague to the airport. Uh, but you, that your colleague gets a quite large benefit from it. And over time, if you're reciprocal, uh, you can achieve a very significant mutualism by taking turns helping one another to the airport. However, there are other contexts in which it is so costly to help the other person that it's not in your self-interest to do it. Uh, not only is it, well, it's never in your self-interest to do this, but it's not even in your long-run self-interest to do this. Uh, if it is costly, more costly for both individuals to provide the good for the other, then it helps the other, then over the long term, you cannot get ahead. Uh, you're basically, the pair is destroying themselves over time by, quote unquote, cooperating in such contexts. Now, search your memories and think, are there cases where you help people even when the benefit you generate for the other person is smaller than how much it costs yourself? I think it's probably true. Uh, and the model I want to explain for you here offers an explanation, a potential explanation for why we might do that. Now, there, there are many other potential explanations, but potential explanation is there are reputational consequences. As long as people care about your cooperating in any context, then they can enforce your cooperation in any context, even when it's, in a sense, and I use this word with irony in this, for this audience, irrational to do so in context number two. However, there is an evolutionary or social rationality to doing so because of the power of convention. Uh, so the diagram at the bottom is just meant to illustrate this model. There are two contexts, numbers one and two. In context one, the benefit, B sub one, is greater than the cost, 
C sub 1 is still a prisoner's dilemma, but over time, a pair of individuals exchanging benefits uh, will do better. In context two, uh, mutualism or cooperation is not favored because the benefit is now smaller than the cost. Uh, uh, the pair continues to another round of an opportunity to cooperate in these contexts with probability W. This is just a standard uh, choice of variable labels in the iterated prisoner's dilemma literature. Um, I'm not going to do too much math in public here because I think that never goes well, but I wanted to be a little bit specific uh, so you get a feel for what's going on. So let's define some strategies uh, for the example that I want to pull out of this. Um, let's think of a set of strategies which are uh, list the context in which they cooperate um, and expect the other individual to cooperate, and they will withhold cooperation if an individual defects in either of the contexts, any of the contexts in which they themselves cooperate. So strategy one and two at the top bullet here uh, specifies cooperate in both contexts, one and two, and you withhold cooperation in both if your partner defects in either. In other words, there's a reputational heuristic here which links reciprocity, that is the return benefit in the future, to the individual having cooperated in both contexts in the past, not just one. Um, you could also have uh, a strategy only one, cooperate in context number one, but not in number two, and you withhold cooperation in number one and only number one if your partner defects in number one. This would be the uh, delivered with irony rational uh, strategy because cooperating in context number two, remember, uh, does not help the pair in the long run. It is self-destructive. It diminishes the group's benefits in the long run. Both of these strategies can be evolutionarily stable. Uh, and this is true even though number one always has a higher payoff once it's common. The population is better off if uh, the strategy of only cooperating in one and uh, withdrawing cooperation uh, if, if the other individual doesn't cooperate in one. Uh, if that's the common strategy, the whole population is better off. Nevertheless, both of these uh, can be evolutionarily stable. And the intuition behind this is uh, one and two can be stable uh, as long as number two isn't too costly. If the self-destructive aspect of cooperating in context two is, is really big, then it, it, it'll drive the population out and uh, of that strategy out, and only cooperating in one can come in. Uh, but there is a quite easy to satisfy condition, which I put, report at the bottom of this slide, uh, that you can prove analytically that uh, both of these strategies can be stable under a quite ra wide range of conditions as long as the cost uh, C sub 2 is not too big relative to the sum, some weighted sum of the benefits of cooperation in both contexts. The reason this happens is because of convention. Uh, it doesn't matter if the population would be better off if everybody only cooperated in context 1. You aren't the population. You don't have control of the population. You only have control of your own behavior. Uh, so if you could get everybody to switch, that would be great, and sometimes societies figure out ways to do that. Uh, but in these distributed sorts of situations, like in this model, you don't have that power, and convention rules, and this creates a large number, actually, of self-reinforcing stable states for the population, and then this will lead history to matter quite a lot. This is an, I've extracted this away from the general analysis in Rob Boyd's paper, which actually studies a quite large, expansive set of possible strategies like this, and he shows that it's quite easy to, to structure a game such that there are thousands and thousands of equilibria, and many of them will not be socially efficient. Uh, uh, models like this lead me to think that perhaps uh, we should be a little bit more hesitant about what we predict animals should be doing. Uh, so with that, let me bring up another animal example. Uh, these are elephant seals, uh, and I think they provide a nice naturalistic um, case study in how heuristics coexist uh, or can coexist in natural populations uh, in their social ecological environments. Elephant seals um, have this fairly spectacular mating system in which um, large males defend entire beaches, uh, harems they're sometimes called, uh, not a metaphor that I like, but uh, I'll use it anyway, uh, harems of uh, cows, uh, which is what they're called in seals and uh, against rival males, and therefore they monopolize the matings and father a bunch of children. However, in elephant seal populations, it was learned decades ago now, uh, there are a large number of smaller males, like the one who is uh, foolishly trying to fight this larger bull, uh, who are sometimes called sneaker males. Uh, sneaker males because they sneak up and steal matings from the harem, in a sense. Uh, they hide on the periphery uh, of the harem, and when the uh, 
slow, large uh, uh, bull male who has driven off his competitors, isn't looking or taking a nap or mating with some other female, the sneaker males run in, uh, leave some sperm behind, and father some kids. And it turns out that these two strategies, interestingly, further study reveals, encourage one another. Each creates a social environment in which the other does well. So you think about the limiting cases. If every male is trying to be the biggest bull on the beach, then the first sneaker male is going to do well because they won't die. Uh, so you can do quite well and, and, and harvest up some uh, descendants that way. And the other extreme, if every male were a sneaker, uh, the first male who tried to drive them away could get more matings that way instead of trying to compete in the mad dash to sneak up and steal copulations from no one who's guarding the harems. Um, these sorts of uh, competitive systems uh, arise quite easily, I think. Uh, and they have interesting dynamics, but the key point is that we should expect coexistence of different kinds of social heuristics, different ways of achieving ends, uh, rather than looking for any particular uniquely optimal social heuristic. Uh, again, this is not a new point. Lots of people uh, in this audience um, will, will already have this in the front of their minds, uh, but it's worth saying over and over again because there are historical reasons that, that scholarship tends to look for uniquely optimal solutions to all kinds of behavioral problems. Uh, and I want to discourage that, actually. I want to search for solutions, but not uniquely optimal ones, perhaps uh, satisficing ones, uh, if you will. Um, so here are the points I'd like to make in this section, in the next couple of slides. Mixes are often superior, so we should expect them to be around. Uh, they can do, mixes can do things for populations uh, that, that uh, single social heuristics maybe cannot. Um, in these mixes, uh, there are a lot of strategies that frequently will behave the same. When we go out and we measure behavior, it will look like every individual has the same heuristic, but they actually don't. And that's because together, the combinations uh, have encouraged a social environment in which the differences aren't expressed. And this, may, this will generate all kinds of interesting dynamics, I think. So I wanna, I'm going to unpack that in a detailed example, so hang on. Um, uh, and the example I'm going to use is the evolution of direct reciprocity, uh, otherwise known as the study of tit for tat, uh, coming back and picking on our lions again. Uh, so I think the study of tit-for-tat really should begin with Hammurabi. Uh, Hammurabi's code um, specified uh, a large manner, almost 300 different specific punishments, punishments for different crimes, but the guiding principle is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That is, a crime should be punished with the harm that was caused by the crime. Uh, of course, famously, Hammurabi adjusted these punishments in line with the social class of the victim. Punishments were much worse if uh, a thief stole from a rich person than from a poor person. Uh, uh, but uh, the general principle of tit-for-tat uh, exists in Hammurabi's code. And this leads, um, ties into the literature on tit-for-tat. It's been a, this famous result, uh, usually uh, attached to Robert Axelrod's um, fantastic book um, on the evolution of cooperation. Uh, the tit-for-tat is an evolutionarily stable solution to the problem of sustaining reciprocity. That is, if you're nice to begin with, that is, you give strangers the benefit of the doubt, but then you're uh, retaliatory in a quite trigger-happy way. That is, if, if you have no tolerance for defection, uh, but immediately respond in kind to defection by defecting, then a population of cooperators can persist. Uh, this is a false result, uh, and I say this with no qualification. This is a result that nobody should cite in the present day. Tit-for-tat is not evolutionarily stable in any evolutionary model. Uh, this is an old result. It is not due to me, uh, but I would like to explain it because it is hardly ever discussed. And I think this is a shame because it's one of the things that leads to, say, looking for tit-for-tat in lions uh, and then being shocked when we don't find it. Um, for example, and I'm going to unpack this in the next several slides, there's a strategy always cooperate, or all C, which is an unconditional nice guy cooperator. All C is the golden rule, unlike Hammurabi's code, which is definitely not the golden rule. Uh, the golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That doesn't mean retaliate, necessarily. It means being nice. Uh, so think of all C as the more biblical uh, kind of um, strategy. And in a population of tit-for-tat, it will have the same fitness as tit-for-tat. Why? Because there are no defectors around, and so it doesn't get fleeced. Uh, tit-for-tat actually creates a social environment in which more tolerant strategies can evolve. Uh, and we should expect them to be there, I think, because they pay smaller costs. And that's the argument I want to develop in the next few slides. Uh, and, and so empirically, many, many strategies end up behaving the same in the absence of non-cooperators. If there are policemen social heuristics out there, they create an environment in which social loafers who are nice 
can persist. And that makes our empirical challenge of discovering social heuristics more difficult. Uh, but these things can have effects on the social dynamics, uh, even if the events that differentiate these strategies are quite rare. And so I want to uh, talk about that in the context of mistakes uh, in the iter iterated prisoner's dilemma game. Uh, so let's extract away for a moment. Let me give you the cartoon version of the uh, study of tit for tat as a strategy that can sustain cooperation. In the simplest model, and in fact, uh, the original one that was published by Axelrod and Hamilton, um, we think of only two strategies. There's all D, which means always defect on the far left of some uh, uh, state of the populations can be in. On the far left, the entire population is all D. On the far right, the entire population is tit for tat, the strategy that starts by cooperating, but then um, copies the move the previous move of its partner uh, that makes it perfectly retaliatory, a, a trigger-happy strategy. And in the classic game theoretic analysis of this, there is some uh, bifurcation point in the middle, an unstable internal equilibrium uh, in this space, in the population. So uh, once tit for tat is common enough, uh, evolutionary dynamics will make it even more common and remove all D from the population, making it seem like a potential solution to this problem. Now, of course, we have to get past that unstable equilibrium uh, they are internally in the population, uh, but there are ways to do that, uh, the, which are not so far-fetched. Uh, so, so far, so good. It looks like tit for tat is an evolutionarily stable strategy um, in response to all D and could sustain uh, reciprocity. However, there's a lot more to this game. Let's just add uh, one more strategy to it. We're going to add all C. Uh, this turns this line into a triangle. Uh, some of you are familiar with these kinds of plots, uh, sometimes called barycentric coordinate plots or mixture plots or Let's just call it a triangle. Uh, this triangle plot um, it has a coordinate system such that if you're in any corner, the population is entirely the strategy labeled on that corner. So if you're in the far right corner, the population is all tit for tat. If you're in the, at the top, the population is all C. Uh, if you're at the red dot in the middle, uh, the population is a third of each strategy. Uh, what this sort of diagram lets us do is plot the evolutionary dynamics in this game in a way that doesn't bias our attention and to favor any particular strategy. Uh, so I want to show, use this representation to show you what happens when you add all C to the classic game. Um, uh, so here uh, I'm going to focus in on the far right in a moment. Uh, the lines in here show you the evolution dynamics. If you uh, pluck a population down at a point uh, in this space, you can say where it goes, and that's what the lines are tracing out, the evolution dynamics of the population over time. So if you're uh, uh, in the far right, say, uh, say you're in the bottom right corner and the population is all tit for tat, uh, this entire margin, which I've now shaded in orange, uh, uh, along the lower right-hand side is, is a bunch of mixes of tit for tat and all C. And all of these mixes are evolutionarily stable. That is, if there's any mutation or migration which introduces the social heuristic always cooperate into the population, it will behave exactly like tit for tat because there are no defectors and therefore it suffers no disadvantage at all. Uh, those processes uh, can eventually drift you far enough up uh, uh, such that all D actually invades, uh, unwinding the whole thing. However, it may not. Uh, the model doesn't say. That is, to, to say what this model predicts already, um, you'd have to say, well, it predicts a bunch of mixes, stable mixes of tit for tat and all C, and we could wave our hands rapidly about other forces like mutation and migration and drift, which might actually destabilize those mixes by eventually uh, removing enough tit for tat from the population such that all D comes in. You don't have enough police officers eventually, and then uh, all C is like food for all D, uh, and it just feeds on it, and then the population goes to the lower left. Um, however, we can make it even more problematic, uh, take us beyond the point that this model actually predicts not tit for tat, but some mix of tit for tat and a bunch of other nice strategies. I've only put all C here, but we can think of a bunch of strategies like tit for two tat, tit for 10 tat, uh, suspicious tit for tat, uh, all kinds of strategies which, as long as they're nice, uh, will be sustained in this population um, at some frequency. And that makes the empirical challenge fairly difficult, actually. That is that the strategies comprise a social environment in which they're co-adapted to one another, in a sense. Uh, uh, but the evolution dynamics over time might be unpredictable. So let me um, problematize this a bit by talking about errors, too. Uh, uh, I think uh, you have to train your attention to, the, the, to errors in the study of um, the iterated prisoner's dilemma, because in the absence of errors, you can get 
uh, thousands and thousands of equilibria, and almost anything can be stable, and all sorts of forces matter that aren't in the model. And that's not a sort of situation I want to be in as a theorist, of telling people that theory predicts anything. Uh, it's, adding errors helps a lot, actually. It helps you reveal differences between strategies that otherwise look identical. Um, and this can help us in the task of prediction as well. In particular, let's talk about implementation errors. Uh, as uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, intuited, an eye for an eye can be a very bad legal kind of uh, precept because it makes the whole world blind over time. Why would it make the whole world blind? Even if everybody is nice, there will be mistakes. Uh, you will think the other person defected, or sometimes you will defect when you didn't mean to. How could that happen? Well, uh, let's focus on a class of errors called implementation errors. An implementation error is when you want to cooperate, but you accidentally defect. This would be something like you meant to take your colleague to the airport, but you overslept. Uh, if your alarm clock had gone off, you would have taken your colleague to the airport. Uh, that kind of error seems quite likely because cooperation is an ordered state in the universe. Uh, the opposite sort of error that is cooperating when you meant to defect seems much less likely. Uh, so I think we can safely ignore that, at least on the first pass in the analysis. Um, as a consequence of this, tit-for-tat gets into feuds. It has no way of knowing that the other person made a mistake and didn't mean to defect. Uh, it merely copies their behavior. And therefore, as a social heuristic, it's very sensitive to errors. It's, in, it's intolerance that makes it look successful in the absence of errors. It is Achilles' heel in the presence of errors. Um, so even if errors are rare, they can be extremely important in the aggregate dynamics in the population and favor other heuristics. Uh, so let me let me reanalyze the uh, tip for tat all D all C game uh, to pull this out just by adding a little bit of implementation error. Uh, the consequence of this is that uh, social environments are really complex, uh, even though social heuristics may be simple. But we have to understand the complexity of the environment to understand how the the strategies can be simple. That is how their simple design fits the social environment they're in. Uh, then a subpoint um, error can actually be adaptive. It's not something. Uh, uh, that we can just sort of hope averages out of the analysis. Strategies, social heuristics may, may be adapted to produce errors because it helps differentiate them from other strategies. Uh, one of my um, chapters from my dissertation over a decade ago now uh, made that argument mathematically. Uh, so here is the tit for tat all the all C game now replotted, the dynamics replotted in this triangle graph, with a 5% chance of an implementation error on every move. Uh, that it, which means if an individual meant to cooperate, there's a 5% chance that they defect instead. The exact number 5% is not important here. Uh, what's important is that it completely changes the game. Now there, isn't, there aren't any stable mixes of all C and tit for tat. Tit for tat gets into fights, and over time it gets removed from the population. If you place the population uh, playing God in the lower right of this figure, uh, you would crawl up the right-hand side to an all C world, because all C isn't getting into feuds. Uh, all C is very forgiving, right? So in a, in a world of cooperators, all C actually does better now than tit for tat does, uh, even if errors are rare. Uh, that process could be quite slow, though, but once there are a bunch of all C in the population, the population is going to quickly move towards the all D state. Uh, internally, the dynamics can be very complicated and take a long time with these sort of swirls and transient states. Uh, so now imagine going out in the world, say, studying prides of lions and looking for a particular strategy. Uh, what should you expect? Well, I would expect some mix of things, perhaps. I wouldn't be too surprised by diversity, which is a point I'm going to echo over and over again again here. And that isn't, I don't think what lions are doing is, is well represented by this game, uh, necessarily. Uh, but the lesson this game delivers, I think, is directly applicable uh, to the study of those sorts of empirical contexts. Uh, okay. Uh, we're getting along here. We're almost done, I promise. Uh, third and final point. Um, not only can many, can many heuristics exist, I think they should coexist. Uh, and that's because they can often be complementary in a sense. The story I've just told is one in which different strategies exploit one another, or they compete, or uh, the evolution of all C undermines uh, tit for tat, or some such. Um, and that does happen, but I think there are other cases where uh, the structure of the population harvests the diversity, recruits the diversity among social heuristics, do things that individual heuristics cannot. And as a result, the computational ability of the population, if it were, uh, actually helps the, the social heuristics achieve something greater than the sum of their parts. Uh, and so we should uh, be looking for these co-adapted uh, complexes of social heuristics in populations, I think, where the, the skills and um, abilities uh, 
of different individuals, since they're different, uh, require different social heuristics at the individual level, and therefore at the population level we can do things like uh, achieve complementarity, um, uh, recruit the benefits of division of labor, and comparative advantage. Uh, the example I'd like to, to use to explore this um, is not doing the dishes uh, in the upper right or ants building a bridge, although both of these things illustrate the general principle, uh, division of labor about who's doing exactly what in, in uh, doing the dishes or taking turns or some ants make a bridge while others crawl over. All this requires diversity and differentiation of behavior, uh, which benefits the group. Um, I want to use social learning as an example, uh, get away from cooperation uh, a little bit. Uh, although, as you'll see, there's, there's cooperation story to be told here, too. Um, Okay, uh, I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time explaining the structure of this model. I want to give you a cartoon sketch of it, uh, and that's because the chapter I recommended as a companion reading uh, to this lecture has this in painful detail, uh, so you can go look at the details there. The citation to that is at the bottom of this slide. Um, let, me, let me start by talking about the, the problem that individuals have to solve. The problem that individuals have to solve in this model, which is meant to help us understand the logic of when uh, simple heuristics for copying behavior uh, rather than doing your own research and development uh, could be favored, uh, is an environmental challenge where uh, there are a range of behaviors. Here it's called phenotypes because most of the time I'm a biologist and we call behavior phenotype. Um, there are a very large number, uh, in fact an infinite number, of different alternative phenotypes. But at any particular point in time, there's only one that's optimal. And all the others are equally non-optimal, equally bad. So you might as well just say there's one good one and all the rest are bad. And the red uh, time trend on this plot with time on the horizontal axis and uh, phenotype on the vertical is meant to represent that, that it is changes through time. So for some number of generations, uh, the same behavior is optimal. Uh, but then there's a switch in the environment. Uh, and in this model, that's purely exogenous, although there are cool models uh, where it's not. Uh, uh, this is the first model we want to do, so let's, let's just stick with the exogeneity story. Um, and it's changing over time, so as an individual, you're born in the middle of this time stream, you've got to figure out what to do. Uh, we're going to study a case where um, behavior has to be learned, and you can learn it either by, by studying the environment you were born into yourself, that is, trying to innovate, uh, or you can copy behavior from the previous generation from the parents who are around, not necessarily your own parents, but your own parents or somebody else's parents. And the question is, uh, when are these different heuristics favored? Um, uh, let me do, let me extend this cartoon metaphor a bit and think about this population. Here's a population of naive individuals, each circle representing an individual. Uh, they have no phenotype yet because they're born naive, but they do have a uh, genetically inherited learning strategy, a social heuristic. Uh, this is a point where I meant to insert, it, I think all these points apply whether or not the social heuristics, the learning heuristics are acquired genetically. Um, in fact, I think it's, it's an interesting point about social heuristics that they're self-modifying or can be self-modifying. Uh, but it's easier to think about the case where we have the transmission system separated. So they're, they're empty of color in these circles because they're born naive. Uh, let's fill in some of them with green, which is to indicate that they have the optimal behavior for the current environment and all the others have a non-optimal behavior. Uh, uh, not only for the current environment, but forever. Remember, we're, we're assuming there are an infinite number of behavioral states, so as soon as the environment switches, none of the past behavior is optimal. That's a mathematical convenience for analysis. You can, you can relax that assumption and get the same qualitative results from these kinds of models. Um, so let's uh, put that uh, population uh, up at the top and think of them now as parents. Uh, however they've learned their strategies, however some have become green and some have not, uh, they're going to have offspring, uh, which is a new uh, level of empty circles now at the bottom. Um, learning is active in this model, so some individuals now indicated by red, uh, uh, the red borders are individual learners, uh, that is their uh, social heuristic, and some are social learners uh, who copy. Individual learners pay a cost to do some research and development, and then they have a chance of acquiring the currently optimal phenotype, but only a chance. Uh, social learners copy. Uh, when they copy, they, they, they can't preferentially copy individuals who have the optimal behavior because they don't know what the optimal behavior is. They can only copy at random in this. So this is one of the simplest, in fact, I would argue the simplest social learning heuristic that anyone has ever written down, uh, copy at random. 
there are much better ones, as, as my chapter goes into. Uh, so some of the individual learners will turn green because they successfully innovate. Uh, uh, some social learners, like say the one there, will be lucky enough and randomly select an individual who's green. Remember, they can't see the green. Uh, they're going to copy a behavior, but they don't know if it's good or not. They only know it's a different behavior. Um, and they become green themselves. Uh, sometimes in this model, because the environment is changing, there's a perturbation, which makes all of the parents white, and then social learners do very badly immediately after a perturbation, and that's the risk involved and why the sort of information economics of these different social heuristics is quite different. Individual learning is a very um, low-risk strategy but high cost, and social learning is a higher risk, lower cost strategy. So the, the, they're different in some interesting ways to generate uh, the dynamics I'm going to spell out for you. Uh, so uh, making a quick point that's spelled out much better in the chapter, because I had a lot more space, um, if we focus on only these two heuristics, learn individually and learn socially, there's no actual equilibrium because the environment keeps changing. And uh, right after a change in the environment, as shown in the graphs in the bottom, uh, the blue time trend is showing you the frequency of innovation, that is, individual learning as a social heuristic in the population. Just after a change in the environment, it increases rapidly because social learning is doing poorly. So there's this brief period after every switch in the environment in which innovation is favored. Uh, once most of the population is doing well, which is indicated by the uh, red kind of shark fins in the same graph labeled behavior, that is, the frequency of currently optimal behavior in the population, once that reaches a high enough level, uh, social learning is way better than innovation because it doesn't cost you as much. And whoever you copy, you're going to get the right behavior. Uh, so there's a time trend to this. But in the long run, there is an attractor, a kind of average level of innovation, which is adaptive in the long run. And the population floats around that. What you don't get is either pure type. Uh, you can push the parameter conditions uh, to be very extreme in this model such that there is only innovation at the limit. Uh, but even that is a fairly rare event. Uh, uh, what this sort of model uh, predicts is actually a combination of the two. And it is the combination of the two, of innovation and social learning in these models, that lets the population do things that individuals can't do. What, what is that? It lets them accumulate innovations across generations. It lets the population build complex behavior that no individual can in invent in their own lifetime. Uh, so uh, uh, I always tell the story in talks, but uh, uh, that's because it's so good. Um, Isaac Newton... Uh, famously said that if he had seen farther than other men is because he stood on the shoulders of giants. And uh, we should amend that to say that if he, he has seen farther than the other men is because he, he was a midget standing on the shoulders of a vast mountain of midgets, uh, everybody being just as short as he was. Uh, we have all benefited from the hundreds and thousands of generations of people before us and the tiny innovations and, and uh, uh, accidental uh, sort of discoveries that they have made that have been transmitted to us through copying. Uh, over over human time. Uh, indiv no individual human could invent calculus, but Sir Isaac Newton could because, well, he had all the other stuff in mathematics up to that point and a social environment that allowed him the free time to do it um, and so on. So it's, it's, it's not just that this model produces a mix almost always. Uh, neither strategy, neither social heuristic of innovation nor social learning is best in any real sense, uh, but also that whatever the individual incentives for individual for individuals to adopt one or the other, the population does things over the long run that individuals can't do because of the combination, because of the mix of the two. Does that make some sense? All right, so uh, uh, next couple of slides I want to go over quickly just to draw your attention to some deeper points that are developed better in the uh, 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 McElroy, Wallen, and Pasolo uh, chapter in the, uh, in the edited volume. Uh, we predict a mix uh, as you ex allow more and more social learning heuristics uh, in this model. The mix depends upon a bunch of things. Uh, for example, we could make the environmental variation spatial such that in different places, uh, different optimal phenotypes are favored and individuals can migrate between uh, different places. In this case, um, there are different heuristics that are favored. And not only that, but uh, you get diversity across individuals. That is, uh, selection will favor uh, a lot of diversity where some individuals are always using one heuristic and other individuals are always using another. That is, individuals embody different heuristics. Under temporal variation, however, uh, selection favors individuals 
randomly using a portfolio of heuristics at different times. So temporal variation means that the environmental state is changing through time, like in the original story I told you. In that case, uh, uh, selection actually favors uh, individuals somewhat randomizing their strategy use uh, for reasons, again, I don't have time to develop it here, uh, but it's well developed uh, in the chapter. Uh, uh, lots of other configurations are around. Some combinations of strategies within or between individuals actually, again, help the population. Uh, they, they help innovation across generations and make the rate of adaptive behavior increase higher. Uh, uh, and part of the, the design problem from our perspective, if you take our job as to uh, eventually apply these insights to designing human institutions, is coming up with structures of populations that recruit individual heuristics and the diversity of them so that it creates these positive population level effects. And I think that's a very hard problem, but we we approach it seriously by recognizing and studying in detail uh, cases like this. Um, last point, and again, this is developed uh, well in the, in the uh, chapter. I won't have time to do so here, but it echoes the point I made with the iterated prisoner's dilemma. Um, lots of different strategies often have nearly the same payoff and can coexist over time. That's just as true here in social learning. Uh, you can add a bunch of social heuristics to these models and get a bunch of interesting mixes, uh, lots of transient states where a large number of quite different learning strategies are around, but they all result in the same behavior. And so not only will it, be, will it be hard to predict that there should only be one heuristic in the population, it will be hard to even recognize them as being different unless we have exactly the right level of understanding. Perhaps we have to study, for example, information search to differentiate these strategies and not just choice. Uh, which is a point, of course, that, that isn't going to be new to this audience, but it's a point that uh, still needs to be stressed again. Uh, so at the bottom, I, I highlight this hairline differences, which I mean is uh, in the time trends in these, in these models, uh, there are typically many generations under which once the optimal behavior has become common because of the action of some social heuristic, lots of social heuristics do well. Uh, almost any social heuristic will do well. And therefore, tiny payoff differences uh, are all that you see, and our empirical apparatus for studying these things may be quite frustrated. Uh, this is echoed by a fairly high-profile set of publications um, from uh, Luke Rindell and in Kevin Leyland's lab. Uh, what what uh, Rindell and Leyland and their colleagues did was organize one of these uh, tournaments uh, to study the evolution of social learning. This is modeled after Robert, Robert Axelrod's famous uh, tournament to study the evolution of cooperation, which made Tit for Tat famous. And in this uh, tournament, just like in Axelrod's, a bunch of independent researchers and teams submitted computer programs, which uh, embodied social learning heuristics. And then they created a big melee uh, in which the social learning heuristics competed. And they studied um, the design features of them relative to one another and how that affected their success in the social environment embodied by the heuristics that were submitted. So one of, one of the things I like about these tournaments is they reinforce the point that social heuristics do well given a particular social environment and the dynamics it generates. You can't conclude from these tournaments that the, the, the winning strategy is the best in the real world. And of course, Leyland and colleagues don't. Uh, uh, but lots of interesting things can be pulled out of the analysis nevertheless. Uh, for example, I'm just showing you a couple of plots here. Um, the payoff differences among the strategies, even though uh, behaviorally these strategies are really diverse, they use information in many, many different ways. Uh, there were hundreds of submissions. Uh, on the left, uh, this is a plot of the mean score. Think of this as aggregate payoff against the rank in the tournament. Uh, the bigger part of the graph here shows only the first 10, and you'll see after the first two, they're all basically the same. Uh, this is especially true in the, in, in the full uh, view that's in the upper right of the left-hand plot, where you see all the strategies ranked. There's a very little differentiation uh, in neighborhoods. That is, there are hairline differences between many of these strategies. And so many other forces that operate in the real world can, can lead to a persistence of diversity uh, in, in, in the details of how information is used. Um, and then on the right, what you're looking at is uh, on the horizontal is one particular dimension of behavioral difference. Uh, one of the most important in the uh, in the tournament. This is the average number of rounds between learning moves. Learning here means innovation, individual learning. So on the far right on the horizontal axis there, what you're seeing is our strategies that did um, a lot of social learning. That is, they, they use lear individual learning infrequently. 
and on the left you're seeing strategies that learn from themselves quite a lot. Now there's certainly a correlation here. Strategies that learn from themselves a lot do worse on average, uh, but in the orange band I've highlighted at the top, what you see is across the entire range represented in the tournament of how, how much uh, uh, individual learning is done by a strategy, you can get uh, comparable payoffs. Uh, in the same in the same kind of range, uh, and that is a factor of the fact of how the social environment, the information environment, is being generated endogenously by the action of these strategies. And even a quite crummy strategy can do quite well as long as there are savvy strategies in the population creating a benign information environment for them. Uh, uh, and that's a general feature of studying social learning. Um, I mentioned Axelrod's uh, famous tournament which started it. I want to bring that up again just very quickly to show you that that's not just true of social learning. This was also true in Axelrod's tournament, although this is not usually what people report about it. Um, the left here is just the book cover in the revised edition uh, of the book in which this is reported. Uh, on the right is a time trend. Uh, you, can, you can go back and you can simulate uh, Axelrod's tournament as many times as you like, and what always happens is there are a bunch of strategies that do just about equally well, and they co-evolve as a cloud and why is because they're nice strategies and, and they do well together. And Axelrod recognized this and talked about it in the book, but it isn't a point that is often brought up because it, it, it doesn't say we should expect tit for tat. It says we should expect strategies which have a certain feature given that the other strategies also have that feature. It's, it's a hard thing to talk about because we don't really have vocabulary for it, but it's not a strategy prediction. It's a kind of social environment prediction. Uh, and as we develop the language to talk about these things, it'll get easier, I think, to understand social heuristics. Um, okay, let me try to close this up now. You, you've indulged uh, this remote talk long enough. Um, bring it back to the problems and opportunities and the problem of Tantalus reaching for uh, the grapes here, and uh, they're always receding from his grasp. I think the lesson with, with many of the social heuristics and the sorts of contexts that I study, at least, is that if you reach for individual fruit, you will be forever tantalized. Uh, you will be like the people studying lions and looking tit for tat. You will not find it. Uh, you may find it in some individuals, but not others. Uh, what we should be looking for is some, something completely different. Uh, or to put it another way, tantalus shouldn't be reaching for a fruit. He should be reaching for the whole tree. Stop trying to grab the fruit and, and grab the branches of the tree and pull yourself up and get the fruit later. Uh, you have to sort of think about this as a meta problem about a population of heuristics uh, and not an individual uh, uh, sort of problem of identifying a particular uh, heuristic. Um, so let's get away from the Tantalus metaphor because of course it has its limits like all metaphors do and come back to the actual substance. Uh, the population does computation so you don't have to. Uh, social heuristics, uh, as Herbert Simon uh, said, are quite simple uh, but that's because they exist in complex social environments that that recruit their simple capacities in adaptive ways. They fit together. Uh, and this is a point that is often made. Uh, heuristics always fit their environment. Uh, when the environment is dynamic uh, and highly frequency dependent, the analytical problem uh, becomes quite different, I think. In character, uh, in particular, you get many equilibria, especially in cases of repeat social interaction, as in all human societies. Uh, there will be many thousands of interactions with the same individuals in short periods of time in human communities, and this must have an effect on the design of social heuristics. Uh, social heuristics can coexist, uh, and not only that, but they probably do. We should expect them to uh, quite often. Uh, let me try to boil this down to some lessons uh, now as well. Uh, we should expect history to matter, and this ties into the questions of multiple equilibria. Uh, we should expect that uh, uh, the initial conditions of how things started or past social environments, for example, may have powerful effects on present social environments and the design of social heuristics, even though those social environments are gone. Why? Because they, they provided initial conditions. They selected for a configuration of heuristics in a past context that made a certain equilibrium reachable when the social institutions changed. And so differences among societies or groups will not be explicable solely in terms of the design of present social environments or even their dynamics, uh, but will depend upon past states. And this is frustrating, but hey, human behavior depends upon the study of history. Uh, that's just the truth of it. And I'm just re-emphasizing a point that's been made by many others in that regard. Um, second, we should expect and measure diversity. Don't go looking for tit for tat and lions. Uh, look for sets of strategies which may coexist or the reason that some lions are uh, more vigorous in defense maybe because they're differently abled 
uh, than other lions. Uh, maybe there's division of labor in other ways. Uh, we don't know. Maybe we've got the payoffs all wrong. Maybe we haven't represented the game right. Uh, but even if we have represented it right, we shouldn't be expect every, every individual line to be tit for tat. And we shouldn't expect that immediate retaliation is necessarily the best strategy because it's easy to get equilibria without that. Uh, uh, Third, we should expect integrated and antagonistic suites of heuristics. That is, we should be looking for cases where the diversity among social heuristics in a population somehow does something for the population that individuals can't do for themselves. That there's, in a sense, uh, a kind of, kind of heuristic function of, of suites of social heuristics, uh, as in the case of the complementarity of different, different learning uh, algorithms or heuristics, as I explained earlier. Um, and I think that's something that's actually quite understudied, and there's a lot of room there to think about that, how uh, diversity enhances function. Uh, every one of the social sciences and the biological sciences and the physical sciences has examples of systems that behave that way, but they aren't knitted together very well across disciplines into a, into a study. Now, I know the complexity folks do think about that a lot, uh, but they're still segregated out, I think, uh, from many of us, unfortunately. Um, so a couple of, of really pointed empirical comments here, and I'm just, I'm just going to label these here, and then I've, I'm going to show you a slide to kind of dwell on in a moment, because I think it's an important point, because uh, it ties together uh, the, the historical and empirical and conceptual obstacles to grabbing the fruit that I started this talk with. Um, we should be resisting highly controlled experiments, I think, and, and that may sound like blasphemy uh, in a scientific audience, so I want to unpack that. Um, uh, and instead, we should be embracing endogeneity and developing research methods which deal with these, these, these three expectations on this slide uh, uh, head on. Uh, what do I mean? Well, let's, let's talk about history again for a moment. Um, I think most of the empirical and statistical methods in the social sciences, especially in psychology, uh, come from Rothamsted Research Manor. Uh, many of you will know about what Rothamsted is. It is still going. Rothamsted uh, research um, manner was started in the uh, early 20th century. Um, the most famous work to come out of there is probably uh, Ron Sir Ronald Fisher's uh, work on research design and statistical methods. This is where analysis of variance is born uh, in this book, Statistical Methods of Research Workers. And things like block designs, as shown in the uh, stained glass window, which memorializes Sir, Sir Ronald Fisher's contributions uh, there in the right of this slide. Um, what does Rothamsted do? Well, they study how different fertilizers and moisture content and, and uh, uh, crop orientations affect the growth of different crops, uh, mainly various grasses like wheat uh, and barley. Um, so many agricultural fields done in random block designs. Rothamsted has been incredibly successful, and a lot of the productivity of modern agriculture worldwide depends upon results, long-term experimental studies at Rothamsted. Uh, the problem with Rothamsted is that it has polluted the model of what is good science uh, in all of, all of the social sciences and in much of biology. And, and what do I mean by that? I said, well, look, you know, animals and their behavior uh, are not wheat plants that are stuck where you put them. Uh, random block designs and analysis of variants and full factorial treatments are great for studying the growth of wheat under different fertilizer regimes. They're not so good for studying human behavior. Uh, and in particular, let's think back to the points I've tried to make in this slide, in this talk. Uh, when heuristics are adapted to a particular dynamic social environment, the, the information they need to function correctly is endogenous to the behavior of the system, to the way others behave in the particular mix of heuristics. You can't realize that if you're controlling all the variables and randomizing them. You, you have to capture the endogeneity to study the phenomenon you're interested in. And by creating these sort of uh, randomized uh, block design experiments and studying them with analysis of variance, uh, which is probably only appropriate if you use these sorts of randomization techniques, uh, we're actually preventing ourselves from seeing the phenomenon that we're supposedly interested in. Uh, and again, this will, for this audience, this will not be such a controversial thing to say uh, because with this audience, you're used to critiquing uh, the sorts of standard experiments. But in the study of social heuristics, this is a very important thing. And it's one of the reasons the other paper I, I recommended to read to accompany this talk, my experimental paper in Proceedings of the Royal Society, um, makes a complicated, loosely controlled experiment where uh, behavior is endogenous and all the information that's available to in individuals in that experiment is endogenous to their behavior. It's not 
highly controlled. The only thing that's controlled is assignment of individuals to treatments, but I don't randomize the information available to them. I don't control any of that because I don't believe we can understand the fit of social heuristics to their social environments if we control the social environment. The social environment is part of the endogenous process, uh, and we have to create an, a set of experimental and observational and empirical methods which fit the phenomenon of interest instead of taking Rothamsted as the model of successful science and applying it in a Procrustean way to everything that people do. Um, all right, with that, uh, I want to thank you for your indulgence and leave you with a, a very meta thought. Um, of course, all of us are, are scientists or uh, are part-time or full-time, and uh, we study socioheuristics. Um, I think one of the things we have to realize is that the study of socioheuristics itself is conducted, it must be conducted, using social heuristics. Scientists are individuals with all the same uh, foibles and population embeddedness of every other decision maker. And of course, we reason with social heuristics as well. Um, and this isn't a novel point, other people make it, but we don't usually dwell on this. And so uh, I think it's a healthy thing to do to remember that we're embedded in environments that make our, our social heuristics either useful or not. Uh, to what extent is the structure of the Society of Science co-adapted to the social heuristics or psychological foibles of individual scientists? How does that system work? Now, this is an area of important applied application of social heuristics. Uh, I haven't worked on this myself. Uh, back in the uh, 1960s and 70s, Donald Campbell and Herbert Steinman and uh, Karl Popper did think about these ideas. Uh, but it sort of got dropped uh, for reasons that I never understood. So I just want to take this opportunity to plant it in the minds of the audience. And hopefully uh, someone will run with this. Uh, with that, thank you for your time.